Well, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Phyllis Spesser. Uh, again, thank you for joining us for this webinar, Coming to America, Gap Funding Through Small Business Innovation Research Programs, SBIR, STTR. Presented by Foresight Founder and Vice Chair of the Board, Dr. Phyllis Spesser. Dr. Spesser was present at the White House for the signing ceremony of the original SBIR legislation for her work in drafting it and spearheading the lobbying effort to enact the bill. She co-drafted the legislation establishing the STTR program and has been supporting SBIR STTR programs for over 30 years, working with federal agencies such as the National Institute of Health, the Environmental Protection Agency, Department of Agriculture, the Department of Energy, the Department of Defense, and so on. She has supported state programs across America as well. A former Vice President of the Association of University Technology Managers, Dr. Spesser is the author of the best-selling textbook, The Art and Science of Technology Transfer. She has helped thousands of technologies enter the market. Under Phyllis's leadership, Foresight has been committed to knowledge sharing within the tech transfer and commercialization community. As part of this mission, we created the Foresight Street YouTube channel as a platform to host our developing webinar series. We feature multiple webinars from SBIR, STTR program managers to highlight best practices within various agency programs, often featuring a commercialization success story. Our next SBIR, STTR program webinar will take place on June 7th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time and feature the Department of Defense. If you're interested in that webinar, you're uh, free to contact us, uh, either Alyssa or myself, uh, through the Foresight website. Uh, my name is Arendt Spesser, by the way. Uh, again, thank you for joining us. Um, one more reminder before we get started, uh, if you do have questions, please type them into the chat box, and we will have time for questions at the end of the session. Uh, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Phyllis. Thanks again. Thank you. <clears throat> So today we're going to talk about doing business in America if you're overseas, and this will be useful, helpful also to people in uh, American uh, universities and businesses. But our emphasis is how to come to America, how to do business from overseas in America. And one way that is often not considered, and that's why we're highlighting it today, is the SBIR STTR program. SBIR stands for Small Business Innovation Research, STTR stands for Small Business Technology Transfer Research. Both of these are programs that are built around small companies, small US owned companies, I should say. We'll talk about this a little more, which means over 51%. Um, these companies compete for federal dollars, R&D dollars under a solicited program. In SBIR, almost all the work is done at a small company. In STTR, um, much of the work can still be done at a university, government lab, or so on, although it's better if it's a U.S. government lab. Some agencies uh, maintain that as the sole requirement. Um, and so we'll go a little over about the SBIR program. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the U.S. business culture, and you can see in front of you the rest of the agenda for the talk. So why is SBIR so important? Well, the first reason it's important is it gives you money. One of the big problems with immature technologies is finding money that enables you to mature the technology, and SBIR is designed to do that. In SBIR, there are two phases of federal money and one phase of non-SBIR money, so of federal SBIR money, or STTR money, I should have said. Uh, the first phase runs between 100,000 and a couple hundred thousand. The second phase gets in the millions. The money is funded through a set aside of federal R&D agency budgets, and there is over $1 billion allocated each year through this program. So this is quite a significant program. Now, because we're talking about foreign companies, uh, foreign universities, foreign institutions, foreign companies, it helps to understand exactly what the U.S. government considers a small company for SBIR purposes. And the first thing to note is a small company is actually quite large. In fact, it can have up to 500 employees. It must be 51% owned by U.S. citizens or permanent resident aliens, which in the U.S. we call green card holders. The principal investigator must be primarily employed by the applicant's small business 
while they're doing it, and they must be a citizen or a green card holder. But up to 33% of the research in phase one and uh, a higher in phase two can be subcontracted to another entity. In the SBIR and the STTR world, uh, the allocations are different. Now, SBR is a solicited program with peer review or internal expert review. So one of the important things about it is when you win an SBIR award, you have an immediate credibility enhancer uh, in the U.S. marketplace for licensing and equity investment. People in the venture community, the angel community, and in the corporate world who are in licensing technology all know about SBIR. This program has been around since 1981. Uh, Actually, 1980 it started, but it, the legislation was passed, but it took about a year to get things really running. It is targeted to U.S. needs. So another nice thing is if you look at the solicitation documents, you can get a good idea of whether there is any need for your technology in the U.S. marketplace at all, because if it's there, there is a documented need for it. SBIR is also a doorway to many other state and federal supplemental programs, funding programs, and others. We'll talk about that. And in U.S. government procurement language, SBR is what we call a MIPRable vehicle. And what that means is once you win an SBIR award, if somebody actually wants to buy the product, they don't have to go out for a competitive bid. They can just go directly to you. Finally, your rights and data are protected under SBR. They can't take your data and give it to somebody else for a number of years and use it to make the product. They can only go to you. Now, why do you care about SBIR? Well, essentially the way we get technologies into the market is we enter a supply chain. And SBIR is part of the US supply chain. So if we look at, this is a supply chain with a series of activities that come down. And there are different vendors in that supply chain that may do R&D product design, product engineering, and other vendors that actually get out to the customer and you can do contract manufacturing and all of this. Well, SBIR allows you to insert in this area over here. That's where the sweet spot for SBIR is. Although sometimes you can get all the way to a product and then come in down here. Now, the important thing about supply chains obviously is there must be some money that comes into the supply chain that drives it. And what SBIR does is provide money that allows you to get in front of a moving target. So if we think about the proverbial valley of death, SBIR is the money that fills that valley. What we see when we look at supply chains is we look at the maturity of technology. SBIR, this is the sweet spot for SBIR. You have a rough idea of what your technology is. You're developing early stage prototypes and system level or, or production ready prototypes. And SBIR is funding prototyping work. Think of it that way. That's the sweet spot for SBIR. So it lets you come in quickly in these two sweet spots in corporate in licensing or where venture capital likes to invest either this generation products or next generation products. Well, so this is the improvements on the current generation that's out there, and this is the next generation. SBIR targets this area, but you can use it to play here, and sometimes you can use it to play here as well. Supply chains revolve around the needs of end users, and the SBIR solicitations define these. When you go to an agency, if you Google SBIR and the name of the agency, Department of Defense, Department of Agriculture, National Institutes of Health, You'll be able to read the topics and they'll tell you what they're looking for, why they're looking for it, so on and so forth. And from that, you get a handle on what the end users are looking for. You can also begin to confirm that this are broader needs by searching on the functionality that you're providing, um, scratch resistant screen, uh, uh, long duration vaccines that don't require uh, no refrigeration and vaccine or something like that. Uh, and the word problem, requirement or need, and the phrase United States. And amazingly, market needs will pop up for you. Now, one of the significant things about SBIR is it gives you credibility. And that's important because you can now pick up the phone or approach 
large privately held and mid-sized privately held companies or small companies as well as publicly held companies and sell to them, sell your technology including license or so on. In the large publicly held companies and the mid-sized ones, the primary goal in the U.S. is to maximize shareholder value and executive remuneration. These supply chains are narrowing and there's lots of bureaucratic hurdles. One of the tricks we're going to talk about in a few minutes is using SBIR and similar small companies that are already in these supply chains in order to bring your technology into the United States. This becomes even more important in an age of Trump where there's an emphasis on America first. In the privately held world, it's a little bit different. Usually there you have more of a balanced scorecard which reflects the priorities of the major shareholders or the founders. And as we all know, entrepreneurial companies are also driven by the vision of the founders and their exit value. And their supply chains are more opportunistic. That's why we come in here in order to leapfrog over here. What makes technology attractive for U.S. businesses investors? Well, essentially, if this is the trajectory of getting a technology to market for the company, once they get it to a certain level of maturity, they can begin to extract the net present value. Notice that if you have R&D funding like an SBIR program, that's an acceleration program, you get to market faster and thus the discounting value, uh, the time discounting on money kicks in differently, risk ticks kicks in differently. So in addition to time being a benefit in calculating NPR, uh, or NPV rather, you also get a reduction in risk. SBIR does that because it explicitly addresses the risks that deter deals. It addresses technical risk. You've been peer reviewed. Uh, there are, is a review after phase one before you get to phase two money to ensure things are on track. And that's also a competitive review. So if you make it through the two funnels, you really have demonstrated uh, strong technical expertise. Another factor in SBIR is once you have won the first time, you have to show commercialization success. So what that says is it helps reduce firm specific risk because the people who are multiple award winners have demonstrated their ability uh, to get to market. And finally, it helps you also address regulatory risk, uh, particularly in biomedical areas, because you can do your preclinicals under SBIR funding. Uh, SBIR also helps you address two other risks. One risk is the IP risk. There is strong pressure in SBIR to uh, patent. Notice that um, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with provisional patent applications. Typically in the SBR program, everybody's tossing in provisionals to get that extra year to market. And finally, as noted before, SBIR helps you address market risks because you have known customers in the government who are seeking this and who have also been coordinating with people in industry. And the reason we call these step function versus probability risk, uh, probability distribution risk, is because a step function risk you can throw money at and you either solve it or you don't. So if it's a technical risk, you throw money at it by doing the R&D, it works or it doesn't work. If it doesn't work, it stays the same. If it works, it goes down. Firm specific to people either know what they're doing or they don't. So you throw money at it, you hire a bunch of people. If they succeed, you keep them. And if they don't succeed, you get other people, so on and so forth. You either pass or don't pass the regulatory. IPs and markets are different. We never exactly know what's being patented because all patents are not, or, or rather all applications are not published the moment they go in. And of course the market, nobody can, can totally control. When we are doing SBIR based or similar small company based market entry into a foreign market, what we're looking for are licensing partners where there is high present value of the growth opportunity. And where that's going to exist is where they have both market familiarity and technology familiarity. I should say this webinar is being recorded. You'll be able to see these flips uh, later on at your leisure and download them. So you can see um, that what we're looking for is we're going back up the supply chain from the end user uh, till we find a company that is appropriately placed where they have some research capability, 
capabilities and development capabilities so they can absorb your technology, in license it, turn it into a product, and then also have some market position to sell it. Again, the nice thing about this is we can go to, uh, and I'll show you the site in a minute, uh, some government sites, search on who's won SBIRs in similar areas to where you are, and then search on those companies, see how they're positioned and make sure they look like a good candidate, and then you can approach them. And the ultimate strategy that we'll be talking about here is giving people research licenses to compete for the SBIR position that have grant back clauses, so any improvements they make you get, and then they also take a license after the research, the phase one research phase and phase two, they are expected to take a full license in order to go forward to market with it. And so you're getting some money as well through this process, but by doing this, nobody is violating the um, foreign ownership provisions. So the bottom line in what we've talked about so far is strategic alliances with US companies is the key to slipping into supply chains. And the beauty of these strategic licenses are, what makes them so attractive, alliances are, what makes them so attractive is you can get federal and state money to help put these deals together. This is the, the intro site for the SBIRS TTR programs, SBIR.gov. They list all the agencies who are involved. You can search for companies there. There's a number of state programs. These state programs provide pre-SBIR money, phase three SBIR money, that's non-SBIR money as matching grants. They often have angel or venture programs associated with them. Connecticut has a good example of it. That's why I give you Connecticut innovations. But pretty much every state in America has some kind of funding program for US small companies located in their state. And it's very easy to set up a US small company, obviously, if you, uh, we've been involved in deals where we've been working with foreign companies and we set up a US company, hire US personnel, and they have a minority interest in that company, but they have uh, licensing agreements so that uh, uh, they are making their money primarily in licensing, not in equity, but that's a path for, if you're not gonna partner with somebody else, you can even set up your own small company. Uh, and then in terms of commercialization, there's obviously money in the SBIR grants. Well, there's not, you may not know it's obvious, but there's 5,000 a year in the SBIR grants to support commercialization or contracts. There is also a, um, uh, a SBIR commercialization support program in many agencies where vendors such as Foresight come in and help these companies commercialize, commercialize their technology. And we've been doing this pretty much since the inception of the program. Uh, there are also other US government activities that provide commercialization support. One of these is called Small Business Development Centers. This is their association. That's um, small business support offices located typically at universities that is funded by the federal government with some funding from the state. There is also small business investment companies, the US government, uh, subsidizes some uh, venture capital companies called SBICs, uh, small business investment companies, to help them uh, fund SBIR and other higher risk companies. We have manufacturing support programs that uh, feed into SBIR, such as the MET program. And there are also procurement offices, such as, uh, uh, this is PTAC, which is a Department of Defense example. So there's a lot of support out there for these US small companies that you can leverage through a strategic alliance or by setting up your own company in the US. Now, in addition, there is an amazing amount of phase three private equity out there. And the equity tends to come in three flavors or four flavors, depending on how you want to look at it. There's angel networks, angels, are, if you're not familiar with the term in the US context, they're typically somewhere between you know, 100,000, sometimes a little less, up to about a million. You get over that, you're into more formal venture capital, and then you're in your rounds. The problem with venture capital in the US today is most venture capitalists aren't interested in seed companies. They're coming in as a second stage, which makes angel more important. Crowdfunding is emerging as a new source of revenue in the US, and there are, uh, you can go to Wikipedia and see a bunch of crowdfunding sites. Um, and then um, 
In addition, of course, there's the state program. And here's a search string for finding those. And there is also, by the way, in these uh, 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 sort of in this ballpark in the uh, venture and angel area, there's these things called accelerators. And these are now uh, we're seeing these overseas as well. But in a, opposed to an incubator, where, where somebody's just renting space and maybe providing services, accelerators are typically set up by large companies as a way to sort of farm team new technologies. And if the companies that sort of take off, they'll then acquire. So you can look at accelerators also as a way to find additional sources of information. I should say in passing, we have a tool that we're building called Hermes that's free and open to anyone. We're going to make it it's, uh, designed to be a shareware tool for our community where people can come and see market research and uh, post their own market research that they're interested in sharing in order to ensure the quality of it. We're about to open it up to others. It'll only be uh, tech transfer office directors, academic faculty and postdocs, and uh, people who hold a certified licensing executive or a registered technology transfer professional certification. And if you're interested in that, you can send me an email on that and I'll get you on the Hermes list. The last flavor of money that's out there is foundation money. There are lots of foundations in the US and foundation money is very important for this. Gates Foundation is probably the best known one, but uh, every patient advocacy group like the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society has a granting program. And every industry sector typically has a granting program. EPRI is the one for the US uh, electric uh, utility industry. There's a gas research institute and so on. How do you find these, pro these uh, partners? Well, the best way to find partners if you're looking for SBIR companies is you go and you search for program winners. And the more they've won, the better partner they're likely to be. Why would they be interested in what you're doing? It turns out that we call these companies SBIR mills. And it turns out what the SBIR mills do is they tell people, you can work here, but it's all soft money. You're responsible for generating your own money. So they have to write lots and lots of proposals. And if you come in with an interesting technology that you're willing to share with the company, you provide a proposal opportunity and thus uh, play into the way that system works. So they are always out there looking for new technologies around which they can build proposals. And there are a variety of intermediaries, including us, that can help you with that, uh, locating those. Another place that is good to look is at people who are doing postdocs in relevant federal laboratories, US government laboratories. Why is that? First of all, they're likely already to be either a US citizen or a green card holder. Secondly, most SBIR agencies give points of preference to people, it's de facto, I should say, give de facto points of preference to people who are partnering with their own labs. And so by using a postdoc who's doing relevant work at a federal lab, you can bring somebody in. Let me give you a concrete example here. We were working with a school, a military institute that had uh, ironically found a better way to control leaf cutting and fire ants, which are leaf cutting ants are a Phenomenal pest in uh, U.S. agriculture, causing over a billion dollars of damage a year uh, because of global climate change. They're going elsewhere. Uh, they've been found in China, for example. Uh, what we did was we formed a partnership to move the technology forward because there wasn't agriculture capability at a military institute with the U.S. Department of Agriculture laboratory that handles ants, and then. After that partnership matured the technology a bit more, we took the postdoc who was working on that project, made them the principal investigator, competed in USDA for a SBIR award, and that award was won, and their research is now going on, and they're getting ready for the phase two. You can do the same thing with candidates, PhD candidates and postdocs at universities, working in laboratories of noted experts, because, of course, uh, the research world is still somewhat who you know, and people who are in famous laboratories tend to have better shots at things. Another really good source is to look for recently retired scientists, engineers, or R&D executives around whom you can build a company. And finally, 
if you're tracking supply chains, like I said, even if they haven't competed in SBIR before, a small company in an existing supply chain who can make your product has the right kind of stuff, and some technical people around, good engineers or whatever, you can come and partner with them because they have enough absorptive capacity to, to be able to manage your team, and in fact, you're bringing them the R&D function at no cost. There are also good places to look for industry phase three partners. Uh, we're all familiar, or many of us are familiar with BIO because that's a big international meeting. There's a society for everything in the US, an American Chemical Society for Chemicals, or the Chemical Manufacturers Society. And perhaps the most important individual society of professionals is called the Product Development and Management Association. Now, as a vice president of autumn, I love autumn. But if I wanted to do a licensing deal, I'm not going to an autumn meeting. I'm going to a PDMA meeting because I want to meet the people who have control over the money, not the errand boys and girls who have to go back to these people and beg them to take an interest in the technology. So what we're really interested in is what we call product line managers, or if you can't find that in a company, the vice president of sales or marketing tend to be good people because they're responsible for bringing cash in. The product development manager has bottom line uh, profit responsibility for an area of the company. So these are places that you can go to find phase three partners. Another way to find them is to look at the literature. I'm sorry, this flip is a little, um, confusing, but I'll walk you through it. What this basically is from a piece of software we've been playing around with uh, in the development stage. And we know that if we look at different bodies of literature, they tend to be correlated with uh, different phases of the maturity of the technology. So if we're looking for immature uh, technology, we would look at the refereed literature. That's not such a good place to look for partners, but if we look at refereed literature that's co-authored by university, uh, rather industry people, it may be a good place to look for partners because we know co-authorship with industry is a leading indicator of licensing activity. Similarly, we can do some patent looking to see who's out there doing a lot of patenting, although I tend to find patent portfolios are not particularly helpful other than as a redundancy check. Do they have this already? Because you have something new, and just because somebody's patenting in the area doesn't necessarily mean they will or will not be interested. Uh, when you get into the um, uh, area over here, we're talking about the trade publications. I think the trade press is one of my favorite places to look for partnerships because I get a handle on where people are going, the kinds of things they're pushing, and so on. And so that's why I say over here, when you're looking at, and this is the popular media, but that's already getting a little late for us. So like everywhere, it's good if you're in a university or an institute to say, uh, or a lab, say uh, when you go out and make speeches, if anybody comes up to you and asks a question and they're from a company, please get their card, bring it back to me, because that may be a funding or a licensing opportunity. You look at who exhibits at relevant trade shows, who's advertising, who's publishing in the trade press, who's won government awards or foundation awards. It's also an, a, uh, a useful tool to call up government program managers or people in associations who are on panels that chair people or members of relevant um, committees and say, who's in this area who might be interested in partnering with us? That's a very useful tool. And uh, a, another useful thing to do is, just like Okayama University and some of our other customers have done, is to set up a U.S. market research or a market representation office or a full-fledged, full-service office in the U.S., a contract office, uh, so you have a presence in the U.S. and the U.S. time zone. If you're in Asia, that's particularly important because of the uh, difficulty in, re in arranging calls. And of course, I've indicated Hermes. One of the things to be aware of in the US, you can go into the Securities and Exchange Commission. They have a database called Edgar. If a company is publicly re uh, traded, you can get a lot of information on that company of their annual filings. You can also go online, look at annual reports, press releases, and so on to see how companies position themselves. 
So the final topic I want to address is how do you cold call? The U.S. culture is very different than most other cultures. In the U.S., we pick up the phone and we call people. It's okay to email them, particularly if they're younger, but even if you're emailing, you want to pick up the phone and call somebody, say, All right, I'll send you an email, that's why I'm calling. Ultimately, you want to talk to the people. It's a more multifaceted conversation. You can flow with it. And here's how you cold call. First of all, you want to have a specific person. You just don't call in to a company or a venture firm and say, I want to talk to whoever deals with this. Because if you do, you will get directed to the person whose job it is to make sure nobody talks to anybody and they'll either be in the legal department or the technology acquisition department or something like that. But they're not people who are actually acquiring technology. You want product line managers, marketing managers, and small companies, senior executives. Worst case, I take a business development person. If you can't find a name of somebody by searching on the web, which you usually can, by the way, then find the highest level person you can find. Go to the company website, see who the CEO is. Call, that, call in, ask for that person's assistant or secretary. When you talk to them, you say, hi, I am lost in your company. Can you tell me who is a good person to talk to about these kinds of technologies? We're doing some market research or we're looking for uh, ways to understand what your needs are. You never use the word licensing or they send you to the lawyers. What I do is I email, I call, I email, I call exact back and forth uh, as a way to reach people. You don't always reach them on the first time. It is usually, if I'm trying to call people, I start first thing in the morning. Think about yourself when you first come into the office. You're, more, you're not wrapped up in things, so it's easier to get you to take a call. Similarly, right after lunch, it's easier to get you to take a call. And often in the mid-afternoon when people are powering down, they are more open to taking calls because it's like, well, I need that cup of coffee now, and while I'm drinking it, I might as well talk to somebody on the phone. The phone call comes as a welcome respite. If they are not interested in talking to you when you do get to the person, ask why. Because that information about why they're not interested is as important for developing your strategy as knowing why they are interested. Or it may be the case that they tell you something and you're like, oh, let me get back to you. I'll check on that. And that's what we call overcoming the objections. You don't take no as no as unless they say, go away, never darken my door again. And if they do say that, you say, do you know who might else be interested? And I've had that happen where I've been talking to a corporate executive in one company and he says, look, we just don't do this kind of stuff. And I say, do you know who does? And he says, yes, I would try this company over there. Can I use your name? Sure. And I call there and I get in and I talk to that person and often a deal will come out of that. It's also useful to view your technology as a teaser. It may not be what they want, but it opens the door for a, tech, a, a discussion. You may have something else that they can license or it's a door for sponsored research. And if they're not interested now, ask them when they would be interested. I'll give you a concrete example. I was trying to do a deal for United Technologies with Weyerhaeuser on a uh, new kind of uh, composite board. Called up Weyerhaeuser during the recession, got to the right person by using this, you know, call the bosses of this, the CEO's office, say, who do I talk to? So, uh, the assistant refers me to somebody else's assistant, refers me to somebody else's assistant. I think it was three hops and then I got to the right person. And then that person, when I finally got to him, said, oh, you want to talk to Mary? I got to Mary. I said, what I, you know, I'm with United Technologies representing them. Here's why we're calling. She says, look, it, the company has said we're not bringing any new technology in until housing starts pick back up. I'm like, so did they give you a metric? And they're like, yes, we need housing starts at this level. I said, I'll call you back then. I called her back when housing starts were at that level, and that's when things began to move forward. So if somebody gives you something, or if they say, call me back in three months or two months, don't argue over when to call them back. Just call them back then. Say, when's it convenient for you for a follow-up? Can I just touch base with you maybe in 
three months if they don't if they say I don't know I'm not sure I'll be interested how about I touch base in three months eh well how about six months or a year from now okay call me a year from now they don't like to say go away so if I call them from a year from now actually they're like oh yeah I remember talk talking to you and as I said before ask everyone who else you should call and if you can use their name it's helpful to develop a script to guide your discussions don't think of this as an interview questionnaire just think of this as thing points that you're trying to understand so you can have a free-flowing discussion and the points are like do I understand why the technology is attractive for you what's your decision process who's involved how long does it take what are the important criteria you use what kind of information do you want? Have you signed licensing deals or research deals in the past? If it's a big company, I always ask, do they have a standard agreement they prefer to use? Because getting it through their lawyers is going to be a headache, and I prefer to modify their agreement. It's easier to do it that way. Who are the ultimate decision makers if you get hung up? And are there other insights you want to pass along to make this process smoother and quicker? Typically, in a, the larger the company, you get more of this kind of structure. You'll be talking to a decision maker, a product development manager. They'll have a technical expert. I never want to talk to people on R&D when I'm cold calling because they're thinking, oh, if I push this forward, I'll look stupid. I'd rather have the decision maker go to them. There may be, so I ask the decision maker, is there somebody you'd like to be a champion for this sometimes? Uh, I try to stay away from the lawyers and here's the sponsor I was talking about who is the ultimate decision maker and it's useful to have some marketing material uh, prepared for the US marketplace the first thing is a non proprietary fact sheet uh, which is uh, you know says what the technology is what it does etc uh, sometimes they want what's called a quad chart you can google quad charts although those are primarily for government agencies. If you have a specification sheet or a brochure, that's great. White papers or published papers are great. And if there's a published patent or patent application, give it to them, don't make them dig it out. The other thing I do that I don't have up here that I do sometimes is if I'm getting a lot of questions, I make a frequently asked questions and I just keep on adding to that and send that along too. Once they sign an NDA, then we get into the proprietary stuff that's discussed down here. Be aware, sooner or later, they're going to want to do legal documentation, so I always have one-way and two-way NDAs available and a materials transfer agreement where relevant. Um, again, I like to use other people's if they're a big company. If they're a small company, it's less of an issue. If you're ever going to do demonstrations, make sure everything is working. Test it first. Have a set of present two or three presentation sites. Here's what you're going to see happening. Um, here's how it works. You can see it here. And have a follow along manual or a checklist that says, we're going to show you this check, going to show you this check, going to show you this check. And the reason for preparing the slides and the checklist for the uh, follow on manual is because they'll take that back with them and give it to their boss. And so I'm helping structure the information flow inside the people I'm trying to get venture from or license to. So that's also a very useful thing. One thing to remember when you are doing venture that I forgot to emphasize is in the venture world, the angel world, the people doing it are as important as the technology. So you want, that's another reason for the advantage of working with SBIR companies. Okay, so this is a little hard to read, and but it sort of gives you an overview of our discussion and how to work the program. You can look at that at your leisure, that's in there. Um, and finally, I'm going to pause now. I've come to the end of my prepared mark, so though I'm glad to answer questions. I'm going to leave you with three parting thoughts. David Spesser, one of the founders of this company, my father used to say, nothing happens without a sale. When you are coming to the U.S., that's what you're doing. You're selling. And in the U.S., unlike many other countries, there's nothing to be embarrassed about. It's okay to be selling. We're, we're an entrepreneurial business kind of culture here. Um, as you can see from our president, for good or bad. Um, if opportunity doesn't knock, build the door. The vaudeville comedian Milton Berle said that. Your job is to be in the door building business. 
I've highlighted the SBIR STTR program and the state programs as one way to find doors so that you can build your own doors. And again, you want to, as my favorite Chinese fortune cookie said, a well-defined imagination is the source of great deeds. What I've tried to do today is just give you a quick overview on how to think about some new paths into the U.S. market other than just trying to go to the same association meetings, the autumn, the bios, or whatever, and trying to talk to the same kinds of people, the licensing, uh, the technology acquisition people, and the attorneys. Uh, so I hope this has been helpful, and I thank you very much, and I will take questions now. All right. Thank you very much, Phyllis, for that presentation. Um, I have a few questions on my end. I'm just wondering, Alyssa, did you have any questions submitted from your end? I do not have any questions that came through on my side, but whatever you had, I'll let you know if I get any more while they come in. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, well, the first question from over here uh, relates to the issue of cold calling. And the, Phyllis, you had spent a couple of slides talking about uh, the importance and, and some strategies to do it. But I'm wondering if you can expand on that a bit and also uh, perhaps in the context of our current kind of techno you know, society of technology where you said it, it might be more comfortable for a younger person to send an email, but still in the United States, even with people who are very familiar with technology and social media, for instance, the importance of calling and talking to somebody on the phone still seems primary. Yes, yes, and I want to emphasize, I'm glad you brought up social media. I find social media very helpful. I find, like, posting into LinkedIn groups, relevant LinkedIn groups, or um, uh, other uh, venues that are more targeted are particularly helpful. And then I get names back. But I find, in, it's particularly in the US context, in an Asian context, people are very concerned to talk to somebody if they don't know all the information. What if I get a question I don't know the answer to? comes up a lot when we teach in Asia. Uh, in the U.S. it's very different. Nobody worries about that because if you get an a, a question you don't know the answer to, you say, I don't know the answer to that. I'll get back to you. Um, let me find out for you. Um, the other thing is, in the U.S. context, the ability to have good verbal communication skills is part of the way people get promoted inside companies and part of the way entrepreneurs succeed. So people have been rewarded for their ability to engage in conversations to, that are cold conversations with people they don't know. So they expect that. That's a, a source of pride and an accomplishment on their part. Very different than in some other cultures like South America where we do a lot of business or in Asia where we do business where that is not the case as much. So be aware that of these cultural differences and if you are uncomfortable doing cold calling, one of the things I find very helpful is to get a video camera, put it on yourself, you know, like from your cell phone for example, and call somebody uh, it can be a trial, uh, somebody you know, or it can be a real call, and record yourself and then listen back to it. If you are going to record somebody else in the U.S. as a real thing, you need to let them know you're recording them. You just can't record them. It's uh, actually a violation of their privacy. But nonetheless, you know, and I don't really recommend recording people because then they become more uptight about talking because they're like, ooh, it's being recorded. But I, I cannot overemphasize the importance of the cold call in doing business in the U.S. You got another got, question? Yeah, I've got another question over here. Um, you mentioned some significant issues uh, in terms of the new administration, and I was wondering if you could uh, continue to elaborate on what you think this Trump presidency means for international technology deals specifically. 
I think the key thing that it means is it's going to become increasingly harder to import technology, finished product, into the U.S. For all sorts of reasons, depending upon where it's manufactured, I mean, this is an administration that is, to put it politely, difficult to figure out. Um, it is, as many commentators have said, sometimes inconsistent in its policies. Yet one thing we know is every time a foreign company comes and says, I'm investing in the U.S. or I'm doing deals with this U.S. company to bring production to the U.S., everybody gets excited. So one reason we're emphasizing this pathway of doing partnerships with small U.S. companies is it is a way to get around this anti-global trade that is beginning to emerge in the U.S. political culture. Um, and in fact, be on the positive side of things. Notice that all you have to do is give somebody, a small company, rights to the U.S. marketplace. You don't have to give them a global or even a North American license. You can retain that for yourself. And by doing a grant back of all new improvements, uh, you get the advantages of, of the uh, uh, results of the research. Note also that as that company goes through a U.S. FDA approval or other regulatory approvals, U.S. approvals tend to be well respected around the world, just like the CE mark is in Europe. And by the way, the same strategy can work in Europe with European small companies uh, <coughs> with national and EU funding. But I, I think that in the current climate, we're all going to have to be a little bit sensitive to somehow doing something that triggers being singled out. And hence, that's why we're uh, laying out this uh, alternative approach for you to consider. It's just not the only way to do things, but it's another uh, tool in the tube bag. And, uh, and it's uh, particularly helpful for universities, research hospitals, research labs with more immature technologies that are not quite ready for prime time in their own country or anywhere else. Note, by this path, you can get it ready for prime time in the U.S., show some traction there, and then bring it back into your own country. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, we're about 50 minutes in, and uh, I don't want to keep people longer than the uh, break that they had. And again, we appreciate everybody who joined us for this uh, webinar. Alyssa, are there any further questions that you've received? Yes, so there's one more question I've got here. It says, please help me understand how foreign companies can be integrated into the SBIR process. Please speak in terms of deal structure. Sure, I appreciate that question. So the deal structure is one of two ways. If you're a foreign company, the primary deal structure is a licensing agreement where you're taking your technology, licensing it to a U.S. small company. I recommend that you, because as, unless the product is well proven so people know they can sell it immediately, just like people are concerned about that in Asia, what you do is you do a research license. So they, have, they, can, they can't make, they can use it for research purposes only, and they cannot sell it. So it's a use, not make, not sell, and limited use, non-exclusive or exclusive in the U.S. And the research license is a standard research license. Uh, it may have a fee. It may not have a fee. If there's a fee, it's typically not more than about 1000 just enough to say, okay, something's going on here, not enough to be a real hurdle to anything if somebody's serious. Uh, but if you're doing pulling a postdoc or something, they may not have a thousand. So I don't even get hung up over that. I get hung up over the milestones, which are you must have submitted an SBIR at this milestone here. The submission dates, because it's a solicited program, is are known that you know you can find the date for any U.S. government, state, or federal program or foundation program, uh, even if it's open 
year round, then you say, well, by this day, there will be a proposal, or by this day, there will be three proposals, or whatever you want to do. At the end of the initial research phase, so the research proposal has an option agreement tied into it, just like a sponsored research agreement at a university has an option agreement tied into it. it says, if you sponsor this research, you have a right of first refusal to acquire the technology. In this case, it'll be, if, you, if under this research license, uh, the parties agree if the research is successful, we will go to a full license or at the discretion of us or the discretion of you or both of us, that's a, however you want to work it. And there's plus and minuses on all these things, but you're saying at the end of the initial research phase, we are going to a full license and you can even negotiate the terms if you want for that full license at that point. It's always amusing to me that many universities are reluctant to um, specify the terms of the uh, license in a sponsored research agreement. We guess at terms all the time. So I, you know, we can guess at terms here too. It's just how we develop terms normally. Uh, the only difference is you won't know how significant the research is. So you may say it'll, the royalty rate will be in this range or something like that. If you want to pin down the terms in advance, not more than, not less than. Um, so that's one way to structure it. Straight licensing agreement, hands off, no foreign ownership, nothing involved. The second way to, to structure it is you can make, if you are a well-off foreign country interested in having a stronger presence in the U.S., you can make an equity investment in the U.S. company. I would make a minor equity investment. And then you have some interesting choices because control becomes an issue sometimes on some of these programs. If you want more, you may do a, you may structure it as a convertible debenture, your equity investment. Then there is no ownership, there's just a loan. But as things go downstream and you get beyond the research phase where federal money is involved, you convert the debenture into equity and uh, at your discretion. Um, otherwise, you can. Uh, play around with classes of stock. You can do preferred stock, non-preferred stock. I'm not so big on that on smaller companies. I just think it complicates things. But uh, you do want to keep the equity investment somewhat minor until the government funding phase is over because you don't want to trigger uh, by coming close to that 51% foreign, uh, or rather 49% foreign ownership. I would keep it 10, 20% at most. And you have to look at the various government programs you're interested in uh, tapping with your partner or with the company you set up to see what the uh, foreign ownership limits are. Uh, I hope that helps indicate how you might structure these things. I'm glad to talk more about it. Yeah, and I, think great. I, I think that was it for the questions I received. Wonderful. And yeah, just a reminder as well that this will be posted on the Foresight Street YouTube page and uh, there's links to that on the Foresight website. Uh, again, with uh, all contact information for Phyllis and uh, other Foresight staff that are happy to answer questions about any of this material or just in terms of continuing a conversation about how to uh, get a presence in the United States if you're looking uh, from uh, international markets and uh, other ways to find opportunities to either you know continue R&D in the United States or to potentially license technology here. So again we thank you so much for attending and hope that you will uh, keep in touch with Foresight and Foresight Street and uh, consider attending future webinars as we make them available. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody.